Patterson's fourth point yep. uh, with regard to how it is that we got here, uh, which he's positing as a you know hundred ish year old uh, period in in the dark in a dark age at the moment. For the methods of scientific inquiry have been conflated with the processes of academia. So we've already said this, but his, his section here is quite good. What is science, he asks. In our current paradigm, science is what scientists do. Science is what trained people in lab coats. Oh, science is what trained people in lab coats do at universities according to established practices. Science is what's published in scientific journals after going through the formal peer review process. Good science is what wins awards that science gives out. In other words, science is now equivalent to the rituals of academia. Real empirical inquiry has been replaced by conformity to bureaucratic procedures. If a scientific paper has checked off all the boxes of academic formalism, it is considered true science, regardless of the intellectual quality of the paper. Real peer review has been replaced by formal peer review, a religious ritual that is supposed to improve the quality of academic literature, despite all evidence to the contrary. The academic publishing system has obviously become dominated by petty and capricious gatekeepers. With the invention of the internet, it's probably unnecessary altogether. Follow well, so asterisk here, I would say what makes what what keeps it useful, even to those who don't think they're benefiting from it, but who are working still within academic science, is it allows them to decide, oh, actually, I only read pieces in these two journals. And therefore, if it's in one of those journals, I'll read it. And if it's not, I don't have to pay attention, uh, which is not a, a scientific approach, but it does help widow. Well, you know, wait, wait, wait. So you're dividing two things. One is the question of whether this is a quality improver and the right. other is curatorial. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes. Uh, following standard scientific procedure sounds great unless it's revealed that the procedures are mistaken. Peer review sounds great unless your peers are incompetent. Upon careful review of many different disciplines, the scientific record demonstrates that standard practice is indeed insufficient to yield reliable knowledge, and chances are your scientific peers are actually incompetent. I'm reminded of another story uh, in which I was talking with a colleague, uh, a scientist, about another colleague who had a PhD such that she was supposedly a scientist. Uh, and he said, well, so-and-so says X, therefore, uh, and, and, and she was in a slightly different subdiscipline from either of us. So-and-so, you know, Dr. So-and-so says X, therefore, um, we can build that into our model. And I said, she doesn't do science. I said, what? I said, she's not a scientist. What are you talking about? She has this degree. I mean, I, I actually literally had this conversation with a, a colleague 10 years ago, maybe, at Evergreen. Um, and... He said, on what basis? I said, no, I'm going to turn that around on you. Where have you ever seen her think or think in any way that is scientific? It, I'm not saying she's a bad person, and I'm not saying the stories she tells aren't interesting, and many of them may be true, but that doesn't make them science. And uh, this was completely shocking to the, the guy I was talking with, who I, who I do uh, regard as a scientist, who I, who I have seen think scientifically and do scientific things. But it seemed to him like the ultimate sign of disrespect that her having been stamped on the forehead with a PhD in a science from an institution that is allowed to do such things, that I, having been stamped on the forehead with a PhD in a science by a different institution, um, having actually done science and having actually been, been engaged in teaching undergraduates how to do science, should say about another such person, I've seen no evidence there's any science there. And being willing to do that is part of what is absolutely necessary if we are, you know, if we are in fact in the dark age, in order to pull ourselves out of that tailspin, everyone who can still think and who is able to look around and go, okay, where's the truth, has got to be able to say that thing over there, not science. Nope. So we are stuck in a puzzle in which the labels on the boxes are almost devoid of information about the contents of the boxes. And so this works in both directions, mm -hmm. right? Because the way the uh, scientific endeavor, the social scientific academic endeavor unfolds involves the need to do certain kinds of work, right? You wouldn't want to report an experiment that you didn't run. So there must be an experiment which requires, you know, certain people to, you know, take a pipette from here and pipette it into there, right? So to, work, to make that cheap, universities, primary investigators, effectively hire people right. to do the work 
That work gets paid for in the form of a degree, which does not say that you ever demonstrated the ability to test a hypothesis or even a deep understanding of what a hypothesis is, mm -hmm. right? Where they come from and how you would test one, right? There's no, there's no guarantee that somebody with a degree that says they should know that knows that at all. And so lots of people with these degrees simply, as you point out, they don't behave in a scientific way. They don't think in a scientific way. And if asked to do so, they couldn't because they just haven't practiced. Right? They haven't learned the counterintuitive part of it. The but thing the, I used to say is that some people wouldn't know a hypothesis if it hit them in the head. Yeah. Wouldn't recognize it as such. Like, what, what is that thing that just came at me? Well, people, yeah. for example, do not notice that paper after paper in journals called things like science <laughs> don't have a hypothesis in them. Right. Right? That should alarm you because it is an essential piece of the puzzle. As we have said, Every paper ought to either lead to a hypothesis. It's perfectly valid to make a scientific observation that then suggests a hypothesis in need of testing, or it ought to report a test of a hypothesis. But to have no hypothesis anywhere in evidence in a paper ought to alarm everybody who knows how science works, and it doesn't. Back when I was um, being asked to do peer review, uh, because that is one of the pieces of free work that uh, working professors are asked to do, my primary feedback on almost every paper that I saw was, What's the hypothesis? I can, like I, I actually stop there. Like, I, I, what is the reason to assess any of the rest of this if this doesn't appear to have been hypothesis driven? In which case, again, if there's no hypothesis, like maybe cool story, maybe interesting observations that then could form the basis for a hypothesis. And if you frame it that way and don't claim that this is a complete piece of science, okay. But they're always, you know, in these journals as if like, oh, and here's the science we did. It's like, but you, but you didn't because you didn't have the hypothesis going into it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, we sometimes talk about the fact that um, there's no good way to teach somebody how you come up with a hypothesis, right? It's really a matter of a lot of thinking about, you know, if this thing that I suspect is true, is true, then these other things that I can measure will turn out to be this surprising thing, right? That's not a, you know, it's a, how do you think a thought kind of a thing? You have to discover it on <laughs> yep. your own. Yep. Um, so yep. it's no surprise that people's educations in science almost all hiccup at that level. And so what they end yeah. up is so yeah. specialized that there's only two hypotheses in an entire field and the whole, you know, your whole career is involved in studying in around those things, but you've never generated one. But anyway, I wanted to point out the other thing. Lots of people who have the degree don't know how to do science because it didn't come up in their training, right? But lots of people who do science didn't end up with the degree because for one yeah. thing, they probably got driven out in the process of being trained, you know, in this bogus art. And mm -hmm. so they ended up in other things. They ended up in engineering. They ended up starting a business, something like mm -hmm. this. Yep. Um, and, you know, we know a number of these people. So, were you to try to- Or driven out of the mainstream economy entirely. You know, there, there are a number of people who are extraordinary at scientific thinking um, who, you know, you are have, would have a hard time finding uh, with any economic mark on the world. Yeah, that's true. There are a lot of people who are unfortunately sidelined entirely and then a bunch of people who've repurposed for mm -hmm. something economic or, or, or design oriented. Yep. Um, but- if you were to try to bootstrap a new, you know, we have the argument in this uh, paper here that maybe we're headed out of this dark age. Well, presumably that would be the result of people's scientific work again becoming visible as a result of the fact that the academy has failed. Yep. But the thing is, I guarantee you, a lot of those people are not going to be degreed. In yep. fact, it might even be an obstacle. If you yep. were trained in the nonsense version of science, you might be less good at doing the good version. That's right. So his fifth line of evidence for uh, we've been in a dark age is five, academia has been corrupted by government and corporate funding. Now, we've said a lot about this already, of course. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to spend more time there right now. But number six, human biology, psychology, and social dynamics make critical thinking difficult. He says, Therefore, the real causes for error are often socio-psychological, not intellectual, an absence of reasoning rather than a mistake of reasoning. This feels very, very important to me. Rather than grapple with difficult concepts, nearly every modern intellectual is trying to avoid embarrassment for themselves and for their social class. They are trying to maintain their relative position in a social hierarchy that is constructed around orthodoxies. They adhere to these orthodoxies, not because they thought the idea is through, but because they cannot bear the social cost of disagreement. So there's at least two distinct things there, <clears throat> both of which we've already talked about today, but it is, 
it is the key problem with many of the supposedly heterodox communities that uh, emerge now, um, and you know, or or were emerging, for instance, before two years ago, and then come COVID, could not see their way to disagreeing with any of the orthodoxy over in COVID space. And this is, you know, this is this is part of why uh, it is not sufficient if higher ed were to be fixed, if the academy were to be fixed. It is not sufficient to scrape the sort of rancid frosting off the top that might be considered to be woke ideology or um, movements to to shame everyone with a different demographic than yourself, which is you know the actually you know racist and sexist and all of this stuff that is flying under the banner of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not sufficient to just scrape that frosting off the top because what you're left with is an equally rancid cupcake underneath. And I don't I don't want that cupcake any more than I want the frosting. <laughs> we need an actually new thing built with built with a combination of enlightenment ideals and and values and the the thinking around how to stay how to keep both things in your head at the same time this is what we think is true this is what i now think might be true instead uh, the probability is maybe I don't need, you know, depending on what the work is, maybe I do or don't need to keep precise probabilities alive around how, how, what I think the likelihood is of the orthodoxy versus my new idea. But as I explore ideas further on, remember always that I'm sitting on some foundation that is probabilistic and that if that fails, what happens to the rest of my argument? That, that little thing right there, which we talked about at the beginning of this hour, um, seems to be something that almost no one is prepared to do. And yet, I think from our experience teaching undergraduates, um, almost everyone can do. Well, first of all, in passing, I love the idea of scraping the rancid frosting off the rotten cupcake. I think, I think <laughs> you hit the nail on the head with respect to academia right there. But um, the, the problem is that only a tiny number of people, A, have the instinct to notice that they are engaged in a gigantic emergent fraud, right? Mm -hmm. And that even if you begin to get that sense, you very quickly get the message that you're going to be injured in a most profound way if you continue to investigate what yeah. is down that road. Yes, and so, yes. you know, if you think la last week we talked about um, why Ryan Cole seems to be one of the only pathologists calling attention to new patterns that they're seeing in medical samples uh, in the last year. Well, what could possibly explain the absence of other pathologists? We did hear from um, we, we did hear evidence of some other pathologists who were doing this work. Okay, well. but, um, but so he's not no, solitary, no doubt. No but, doubt he's not yeah. perfectly singular. Yeah. But nonetheless, if this is happening generally, then the point is, why aren't all the pathologists mm -hmm. uh, pointing this out? And the answer is, what happens if you discover that um, in my job? If I do my job, I will lose my job, mm -hmm. right? What do most people do when they discover that doing the thing you've been hired to do is going to cause you no longer to be hired to do anything? Right. And the answer is most people don't have a backup plan. They don't have a mental architecture for thinking what that implies. If I stand up alone, I'll get shot. I need a critical mass to stand up with me. Uh, everyone knows that they can't be first. And so how do you even, how even if you knew that there was 20% of your field who was willing to stand up, that you'll actually all stand up right at the same time, as opposed to kind of wait until you're maybe second, right? And, you know, things that would have seemed impossible in advance, and this is not about um, academics, but things like the vaccine mandates kicking nurses out of work when what we need, what we are told is that we need nurses more than ever. And I believe that we need nurses more than ever. And yet at exactly the moment when we actively and a hundred percent need skilled professionals, those skilled professionals are not being allowed to work because they stand up because they are standing up to what they view as unconscionable mandates, um, both for themselves and frankly, for, for others as well. And so if, if the system such as it is, is willing to do that to nurses, of course, it'll do, it'll do it to anyone. It'll do it to anyone, and it can do it at a level that is almost impossible to believe, right? What are the chances that the COVID dissidents would include 
the guy who invented the underlying technology behind the vaccines, right? That's a stunning piece of information, but the point is he is dismissed as, um, well, he's dismissed in every way, right? He's Everything they can possibly say they do. He's yeah. making it up. It doesn't matter that he's got the receipts, that he's got the patents and all of this. So, right. the point is there is no, it's not even like, well, I don't want to stand up alone. You know, it doesn't matter how large the number of people are or how credible they are or most importantly, how predictive they have been, right? right? When the people who have correctly predicted the you know, the pattern that would emerge in the pandemic are dismissed as charlatans and the people who got everything wrong are the ones doing the dismissing. It should be obvious that if you're going along with the people who haven't gotten anything right yet, you're on the wrong team. But nope, that's not how it works. The fact is the real message isn't those people are charlatans and they're wrong. The answer is if you stand with those people, you're going to get hurt. Yeah. <clears throat> you don't want to get hurt, do you? One last uh, short excerpt from this remarkable essay. Individual who, individuals who consider themselves part of the smart person club, that is, those that self-describe as intellectuals and are often part of the academy, have a difficult time admitting errors in their own ideology. But they have an exceptionally difficult time admitting errors by great minds of the past due to group dynamics. It's one thing to admit that you don't understand quantum mechanics. It's an entirely different thing to claim Niels Bohr did not understand quantum mechanics. The former admission can actually gain you prestige within the physics club. The latter will get you ostracized. <clears throat> All fields of thought are under constant threat of being captured by superficial consensus by those who are seeking to be part of an authoritative group. These people tend to have superior social and manipulative skills, are better at communicating with the general public, and are willing to attack any critics as if their lives dependent on it, for understandable reasons, since the benefits of social prestige are indeed on the line when sacred assumptions are being challenged. So that actually just perfectly wraps up what we were just, just discussing. 